Oh, they're on. You've been hearing everything we've been saying about them. And the theft is nine tenths of the law. Hey, welcome everyone to the final keynote of uh, 2005 CG Expo. Thank you everyone for attending this weekend. Uh, it was, I think, a great show, and I hope we're really having a great time here. So, uh, for our final keynote, we have the Atari Software guys, and to my immediate right, we have Rick Moore, whose uh, accomplishments include playing man, Pinball Challenge and Pro Football for the Bear Child Channel F system. We also ported Space Invaders for the Atari VCS. I'm sure you're familiar with that. He's also did the, uh, in my opinion, the vastly underrated Maze Craze, uh, which is just a, a huge accomplishment for the VCS. And he helped design Space Tool, also known as Asterix 3, and you can play that out right there on the floor. And to his right is Jim Peter. And Jim. And he did <laughs> Flag Capture, Skydiver, Real Sports Football, Atari 5200, and of course the Sears exclusive Steeplechase. And, and, and Flag Capture. It's always so good you have to say it twice. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, I'm sure you all know, uh, or of course, he did uh, for Defender, for Defender, for the Atari VCS. Uh, he also did Real Sports Volleyball, Desert Falcon, Roadrunner, and he also worked on Rampage for Activision. And next to him is probably one of the most colorful characters of the entire one there. If you go by shirts. <laughs> <laughs> but his Howard Scott Warshot, who of course did Yard Revenge, uh, the also underrated Raiders of the Lost Star, and the also, in my opinion, unfairly maligned E.T. <laughs> <laughs> you don't need to back off on this. <laughs> And also, take a one quick moment, if you have not purchased his DVD or seen his DVD, it is of uh, utmost importance that you buy it from. You can get it at the booth, the CG Expo booth, is that mm -hmm. one? Exactly. Right. Uh, it's it's how much? 20 bucks? 20 bucks at the show, yeah. It's like 35 online, 20 here. And he'll sign it even, I believe. And it is well worth hearing the stories uh, and, and hearing what, what went on in those days. It's, it's great stuff. And next to him is Steve Loya. And he, he began his career at Apple Computer. And he uh, was creator of a device called Joy Court. And that allowed four game panels and two Atari style controllers to be hooked up to the Apple II. And he also worked on Claude Run, which uh, was the first video game in voice that it didn't require a hardware attachment to run. Uh, an amazing achievement. And he also worked on uh, Taz and Astro. And we also had a late addition, fortunately. This is Alan Murphy. Uh, he was the second game animator in the industry. He worked on over 100 games. Some of those highlights include 5200 Pac-Man. Uh, he worked on, on Defender with Bob Pilar. And he also worked on Gauntlet, uh, for the, the, the coin app of Gauntlet. So please help me welcome. We can. I think they're just very open to just taking questions right off the bat, and then that will get their engines running. I promise. <laughs> Anybody at all have a question? <laughs> they're just being shy. Yeah. yeah. How many of you guys are still making games, and how many of you guys actually still play games? <laughs> <laughs> I'm still playing games. I was making games till two years ago at 3 <laughs> And that situation solved itself, but I'm definitely still playing games. I still play racing games, uh, like arcade racing games, uh, when I find them. But, uh, not as much anymore. I'm just not into a lot of the current games. I'm still, you know, I'm still playing pretty much every day. Um, I'm still playing. I'm still playing. I'm still playing. 
Oh, I'm just looking at this. Um, I'm actually working for a company called Digital Press, which is, I think, a sponsor here. And they, you know, they're, they're keeping it coming in. And I'm working on what's called a plug and play system. It's basically a joystick you put in the TV and it's got games, uh, hardware, and we're hoping to get in some of the history of the TV. I play a review topic. Rent that thought it was mercenaries when I'm trying to finish right now. We only have three hours to leave. So. <laughs> uh, they try to, not try, no, just to dig. What am I going to do? I got a game for you. <laughs> About six, six months ago, I finished a game for the Jack's uh, joystick game that I was talking about. Plug into the TV for Spider Man 2, and we have seen it in the circuit. So, how many batteries? The one thing I might do, though, that's actually I'm still talking to some people about, is the idea of doing a Yars 2, a Yars Revenge sequel. That's a design I've had for about 10 years, and uh, just trying to find a situation where it might work out to do that. So. If you do, would it be as a PCS game or for another platform? It could work on any platform. It would be an easy game to implement on virtually any platform, but 2600 would be a very straightforward thing if you have a paddle control. So you need a paddle control. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, think, I think also a lot of us are in, in different, uh, different businesses. You know, and so, you know, focus our time on those areas and, and uh, you know, we're just not, not in the game industry anymore as, you know, you know, employ employed in the game industry as, uh, you know, designers or programmers. So we, we tend to be focused more on other things. We still keep coming back to this, though. It's fun. <laughs> And we come back because this whole industry has got to start in engineering most of the things taken off from there. We would like to answer questions, you know, that Howard may have left out in his Once Upon a Tire series. You know, Did I go Once Upon a Tire series? <laughs> <laughs> Where can you find that Once Upon a Tire I don't know, but if you ask me at the CG booth later, I can tell you. <laughs> Question for Howard. You once said that if you had two more weeks to uh, work on ET, you could have had it down a little bit better. Have you ever considered, or have you just decided to put that two weeks in and see if you could actually make it better, or finish it, or put it in kind of the director's cut you? <laughs> Well, there's like two questions there. One is like, you know, have I ever really thought about what I would do to change the game to improve it? You mean? That I've given a lot of thought. You know, would I actually do it? Mm, not likely. <laughs> not likely. The first thing I would do is I would fix the pits. <laughs> fix it so you just don't fall into the pits all the time. That would be the first thing. Yeah, if I would have gotten three more days to work in that game, I think it could have been a much better game. You start with something about very easy now. But, uh, I don't know. Last week. <laughs> I see it in the last couple days. <laughs> but it's, uh, yeah, it was a five week game. So it was, uh, what are you going to do? You know, I tried to do a full, complete game. It was innovative in a new kind of style with a full world representation in five weeks. Maybe that wasn't the smartest choice. <laughs> and, but we went down, like, there was a day where I got this call and said, okay, we're going to do ET. We need it in five weeks. And I'm like, yeah. You know, but I said, okay, I'll try and do it. You know, I'll try and do it. I really wanted to do it. And so I said, okay, well, in two days, we're going to go fly down to see Spielberg to present the designs. I said, okay, so I came up with the design for the game. That, it's essentially the game that you see or have seen. <laughs> and when I got finished laying out the whole plan, the whole design for Spielberg, he said, well, couldn't you do something more like Pac-Man? <laughs> on some levels, it was like really humiliating to us. Thinking, you know, like, well, geez, you know, couldn't you do something more like the day the Earth stood still stays? <laughs> you know, but in retrospect, I don't think uh, it was a bad idea. <laughs> you might have had something there. You didn't say that, did No, I thought very loud. <laughs> yeah, but it could have been fast, much, and we Sorry, sorry. <laughs>
um, you know, we pick what we want to do and then go design it and program it. But some of the more junior people have come on and made, uh, you know, here, we have to do this. <laughs> and get assigned that way. And marketing, I always thought we were snow on, on what could not be done. And I think we were in another building over the winter, right? I want to go to the orange supply. And um, there's like seven NBAs that we had. One guy named Joel Overman, basketball player. And he's in a suit. But he said he's in the NBA. He's so, doing a great job. And so he was in a suit at his desk, and I had a question to ask him, and I went around the corner, and he had a Cybex 6502 book in his hand. I said, Joel, what are you doing? He just he dropped it down. He said, just see if you guys are snowing me. <laughs> I am on the go back when when I first came to Ochara, the water bottle that was doing this adventure game. And uh, I'm sure you all heard about it. And I'm also sure you've also heard that we have 120 bikes and it just seems so which was actually a big improvement from the previous days when I had 64 bikes. At these 20 or 30 of them to draw the screen. But still, you know, that really is a small amount of weight. And, and you're, you know, like trying to make airplanes move across the screen and chill down. And, and more, had nested structures of rooms that were within rooms were within rooms. <laughs> and you have this real complicated data structure. And here we are, the rest of us are trying to move bullets. <laughs> so yeah, this made a big impression on me. I think it first came out in Superman from the rooms of thin rooms. Then Warren went on to uh, be one of the co-founders of the learning company that did a game called Rocky's Boots, which was education. So he decided to go that way. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, maybe it was basic, basic, basic program. Instead of basic yeah, yeah. 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 it was. Anything on the Atari movie you're making? The newer, newer one for how it's got one shot? Yeah, well, as a follow-up to uh, the documentary and stuff, I'm starting to look at a picture of doing an actual movie, a Once Upon a Atari movie. Or I think I got a screenwriter who's like interested in this, and we're looking at doing a thing that's like a combination of people's comments on what was going on there and reenactments of some of the things that went on there. Because, like the things that went on there, it's you can hear descriptions of them, and that's one thing, but to see this actually going on would be very interesting. <laughs> I don't know what you do with someone like Todd. You know? I'm still talking to Sharon Stone about playing me, so I don't know. <laughs> I don't think he'd want to hit his head on the sprinkler. Well, do you know about that? The sprinkler lobotomy? How many of you know the sprinkler lobotomy story? Everybody. <laughs> He used to climb the walls and hit his head on his sprinkle. Didn't he put holes in the wall when you'd walk like that? Or, you know, you'd go like this. Yeah, we had really narrow walls. And you put them like up on the wall and then you know, just kind of, I don't know how I did it. Actually. It was really high one night. They were really intriguing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I hit his head on the little sprinkler head with a little blade on it. Cut it wide open, fell down, and just like laughing. You know? <laughs> Took him to the hospital, and he went to the hospital. Yeah, they took him over there, and the, and the nurse goes, you know, what happened? I said, I explained what happened. She goes, no, really. <laughs> <laughs> I go, that's really what happened. <laughs> so Todd actually gets written up at the hospital. It says, like, programmer injured while climbing the wall. <laughs> Was that before Pac Man? Was that before Pac Man? That was a little after Pac Man. I think Todd did a lot more wall climbing after Pac Man, I think, than he did before Pac Man. But to this day, you can still see uh, part of his hair hanging on the sprinkler head if you get to go to that. You can still see a part of the sprinkler on his head. <laughs> Um, I was wondering, since the homebrew community got real big, a bunch of hackers came out and started to sort of restore some of the faithfulness to the arcade adaptions that allow us to, you know, conversions. 
besides the technical constraints of the machine going from you know, the powerful arcade machine to the 2600, what went into some of the decisions about changing some of the designs from the arcades to the 2600 versions? Mostly the controller aspects. Um, there's no defender trying to get all those buttons into a joystick. I can answer that one. We, we had kind of a running joke where, at least as far as graphics were concerned, I mean, you can come out of the okay with something like I don't know, a or something. And it's, yeah, it's got a lot of color design and stuff, but we're driving it. It doesn't really do it. But we'd be asked to put, you know, all of those graphics in what? How many colors? <laughs> Well, like four. And so the joke was like, well, this pixel here is a Porsche 911. <laughs> and then that black pixel behind it is the top. <laughs> and I mean, seriously, it was, that, it was that extreme. It was like trying to draw, you know, with your hands behind your back. And it was just, it was just crazy. Yeah, one of the things that, that we did do often, though, just because of the difference of the home experience versus the arcade, is we would put more options in for ways to play the game. So you could play um, single player, double player, um, you know, upside down background, whatever, you know. And and um, in arcade games, you generally, you know, in coin art games, you don't do that. So we actually did some things that they couldn't do, um, but mostly it was, uh, you know, just a matter of we didn't have the processing power, the memory, etc. That, that the arcade games had. Right? You know, you put a thousand versions in, and hopefully. Somebody doesn't like the first one, by the time you get to the thousand, it's been a while. Well, it got pretty quickly to the point where you had like a 1976 technology chasing state of the art 1982, 1983, 1984 technology. And you know, if you go by Moore's Law or whatever, then you're basically looking at stuff that is literally 64 times as powerful as what we're working with and trying to emulate it. So, you know, it's not good. You know, that's why there was two ways to deal with the arcade game. You either reduced, I mean, it's a practical level, you either started cutting back on what the game would do, or in some cases, you just make a different game. You know, in the earlier days, when they come with arcade games, they would like you to do this, you might be able to do something else. That's what Yard's Revenge was. Yard was supposed to be StarCast. And I said, you know, this is going to suck. You know, why don't we just do a better game? And it was early enough then that the marketing people hadn't realized, oh, I don't have to do my job, I can just get licenses. <laughs> it's like, that was, uh, that was so acceptable to not do it. Later on, it wasn't okay. You know, if you were going to do Pac-Man, you couldn't say, well, that's not going to work well on the system, we need to do something else, because they go, no, this has to be Pac-Man. And then when it has to be like Tempest, and then Crystal Castle and stuff, <laughs> that was just absurd. Anything tangible, a movie or an arcade license, that is pressure enough, because then it, it, there was a timeline on it. it. Christmas coming around, marketing had a tangible need that could be filled by our group. That was another reason not to do the conversion. If you're doing original, uh, you're just, you know, they don't even know what you're doing until you get to a certain point and submit it. So uh, that's another pressure that's not on people that are trying to revamp these things right now. They have no due date, you know on something that's tangible like a movie license and you know, or you know, conversion. Who asked for money to get a great Stargate? Uh, and we had a very short time frame. Um, three months. And there was nothing on the screen for like three months, literally. You know, and you see the sleeping bag in the chair. And then they build all the money to wake up. Check it out. They just turn it on. And the whole kernel was there. And that was just blown away by it. But up until that point, it was, it was pretty nasty. It was nothing was shown. Um, what about the the size on the, the size of the memory for the cartridges, even when bank switching became more like used? I mean, I look at a game like Solaris that got really created in '84, and really like. Why, why did, were there more games even from that era that uh, took advantage of that? It depended on, I mean, like when I was, the last game I was working on was Garfield, and I wanted to use 16 May. Uh, yeah, I think. <laughs> 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 well, he wanted me to use 16 May. Usually it goes the other way. It was a little bit, but yeah, it was 16K, and, and they allowed it. You know, I was going that direction with it, just because it had a, you know, a huge license behind it. 
Well, when you told them you were going to be 16 men, they were very excited. They got a big side because they heart size physically. Did you know? Just dive with me in the center. Right, edit all that stuff. It took a long time to say it, and we still can't say bigger than a button. Yeah. Terrible box. Lee, did you have a question? I was on the same lines. I was just wondering, you know, same question is, if you were constrained by management as to the size of your game, and at what point, when you realized you could do bank switching, if it was allowed? Well, you know, there's a cost issue too, because you know, if you had a card, if you had more memory in the card, it cost more. So, uh, if they felt that it was going to be a big seller, or they had a big license and promotion with it, they'd be more likely to give it to you. Have a cool title screen, and then we'll go, right. ooh, how'd you do that? And then you can start working them from there. Right. <laughs> but there was a lot of going on, so the price is going down in the year. Yeah. But the bank switching stuff really only started relatively late in the game, and then Atari fell apart, you know, not long after that. So there would have been a lot more bank switch games and a lot more big memory games, except that it wasn't that long after we first had that available that everything kind of blew up. That's why you don't see too many games that are like that. And really, I think like even for Pac-Man, like Todd used to whine all the time, like, oh, they're forcing them to do a 4K, want to do an 8K, and it could have been such a better game if it was an 8K and stuff. But, but that, was, that was a game where there was a conflict about it. And after that, not, there wasn't many conflicts. Like they were happy they could do more memory because things did start getting cheaper. Yeah. Including the man. You just got a bad after for that game. I mean, 4K is still amazing. Why they didn't give me? Why it's Those wussy programmers can do fine with 4K. What do they need to <laughs> Well, in our development systems, we weren't limited, so we would uh, be able to use as much memory as we wanted in the game, and we would give them a round ball, and we would say that uh, you could have this if you give us more memory, but not would just cut it down. So they could see what they could get. So that also launches the kind of thinking like, you know, oh, they can make a round ball, they're just old now. <laughs> <laughs> so in the arcade game panel yesterday, they uh, talked about there was an exchange program where the console people went to arcade and arcade with console. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah, they, they were supposed to say that. <laughs> <laughs> no, those people were usually beaten up, though. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so we to talk about the kid, what conflict if there was between you guys and our yeah. kids. Yeah. I think that they, were, they used to have a gallon. Yeah, we had, I went to a one time, well, um, I was kind of pissed off because I was a little scowled with the cash cows and going off and Um Actually, I, was in, I went to Coin Off after the consumer collapsed. But, you know, I mean, you get, there was definitely a lot of these uh, consumer and Coin Off kind of going on all the time. I mean, you know, it's funny, but it was not real. <laughs> And anyway, um, I went to a, some kind of get together and, and, and all the coin-off people showed up with vibrant pink t-shirts that said, coin-off, the real Atari. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, consumer people were kind of thinking. You see it all the time. I'd walk over from consumer over to play their game, you know, game for awesome, and I'd see all that and start to feel kind of like what's going on here. Yeah, the little guy. Yeah. <laughs> Well, we got some good sized checks, and they didn't at the time. So. <laughs> It's the thing that took that had, I think, very understandable paces. It was sort of like a stepping kind of a thing. It's sort of in, in the beginning, you know, and I think I could understand how they would feel like the coin up people were doing innovative stuff with new hardware every game, and there was a lot of stuff they needed to get together and make work, and they were making better and better games. Absolutely. Because well, they had better hardware. What they would say is that if they had a design problem, they'd just throw hardware at like, We had to do Yes, they would. Yeah. But they could. Yeah. Well, I'm saying is that they did. Yeah. Right. We could. But the thing is, from their point of view, I think they were making much better games than we were making. And like, they damn well should have. <laughs> because if you can use whatever hardware you want, if you're not coming out with better games than we're making on the VCS, you suck. <laughs> so they should be making, but they were making better games. And they were making more money. So in the beginning, they, nobody was complaining about the money because the people in VCS were really glad to just be here making games, and the people in Point Out were making a lot more money, and they were happy about that too, and they were making better games. But then what happened was suddenly the market for the home games, not as good as they might be, 
became huge. And so as in terms of revenue source, a lot more money was coming in from the home games than was coming in from the coin-op games, even though the coin-op games were better games, which made some of the coin-op people a little better and made some of the home people eventually a little richer. And that got to be a source of tension, but then the money shifted back a little bit and they started to come up with some more money for coin-ops. In the end, a lot of the animosity was forgotten, but then you have some people like, you know, Todd, who would go running around <laughs> showing stuff and shoving stuff in people's faces, like yeah. generating animosity, like big checks and huge checks, and not just Hungarians either. You know, so. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so there was, there was shifting ties, and there were some relationships that got strained. There were some friendships that remained throughout between the two groups, and you know. As a whole, the groups, I think CoinUp didn't like BCS a lot more than BCS had any animosity for CoinUp. You know, I think, and I can understand where some of that came from, and on the other hand, you know, like, huh, what are we going to do? Yeah, but you know, I guess to your original question, I'm not aware of any formal exchange program that ever happened where Ed there was some, and, uh, yeah. somebody else. Ed Rob did, uh, Ed Rob was in corner up and he did a fell on the 2600 and from that point on he scored it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, once was enough. Yeah, there wasn't a lot of swapping. Well, we, did, we didn't do any coin up. The swapping went on in the hot tub. <laughs> <laughs> I love the swapping. Yeah. Really? Oh, yeah, I started off in the BCS one day with a camera thing. Oh, for space well, early on there was a couple of exchanges, but I think once we got to, once we started making 4K games in BCS, if you look at that at the time frame, right. I think from then on, I don't think there was any switching back and forth. There was a... Probably not after you started getting all that money. <laughs> <laughs> no, before the money, once we got the memory. And then after the, after the money, I mean, after the BCS started paying the big checks, then the client guys got because they were creating new fantastic games and just getting forward to BCS and the BCS guys got the checks. Yeah. 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 And I can understand people you know, getting pissed off about that. Because you know, if they do the game origination and the game creation, you know, other people are cashing in on that. Yeah, maybe there should have been a feedback to the coin out people if it was, they weren't always Atari coin outs that we were doing. <laughs> that was another aspect of it. But any one of them could have came up to a group and done a 2600 game. Wasn't that fair? Well, there were a lot of people that tried, didn't want to keep doing them. <laughs> I got a question. After the success of that division, was, uh, what was to keep you folks around at Atari? What, uh, I can address that because I was actually probably were you, were you there when Activision started. I wasn't there when Activision started. I was there before Magic started. Yeah. I came just I, after. I was there. Um, I think I was like the seventh programmer hired, and so four guys took off for Activision, and one other guy left because he was no good, and another guy went crazy. So. Um, <laughs> Got so I'm actually, you know, let's think about this last year, I was kind of a link between, I was with the first group, the programmers, then I was with sort of the second group, and then like the third group, and then I left in uh, you know, 84, June of 84 or something. So I saw, I was in consumer the whole time, except from the very, very beginning, but I was with that first group while they were still there. Um, when they left for, for um, Activist, you know, it was really a shock because these were like four of the, you know, first guys there. You know, um, I think Brad Stewart stayed. Uh, he was one of the early guys, but you know, Kaplan, Crane, Miller, and uh, Whitehead, they all took off, and so there was me and Brad Stewart, and then we brought in a few other guys like Robinette and um, Tom Rudolph and some other people, and th there was there was animosity, I think, in the sense that. You know they left, but it didn't really start. Um, it didn't really start hitting. I mean, it concerned Atari's management and Warner, but it didn't really hit um, as to how serious that was going to be until they started being a success. So I don't know. Does that answer your question? Well, I was just kind of wondering. Uh, you know, after the success. Why would you want to work at Atari? Oh, well, there was a sequence that went on. Yeah. The activist, like just like Jim says, I mean, the Activision guys left, but nobody knew what that meant. Yeah. All they knew was that these guys knew there was a lot more money going around, and they went to Atari and said, "Give us more money." Atari said, "No." 
So they left and they formed their own company. So, but now we have to see what happened. But then it started to work. So now it was something, and there were people among us, I'm sure, who went over and talked with them or interviewed with them at times to see what it was. And then a magic form. Okay. Now, a magic was the second round formation of that. And there were definitely people I know from firsthand experience who definitely went to go interview with some of these other companies while that was going on. And then there was one point where there were a few people who there was going to be a third formation. And instead of it just being a secret, one of the people who was involved in the third formation went to the guy who was the head of software at Atari and said, you know, these people are going in this next round. What are you going to do about it? And that's when suddenly, you know, Atari had come up with intermediate plans that were pretty lame royalty plans to try and keep people there because they're thinking exactly like you're thinking. It's like, wait a minute, you know, this stuff is happening, it's going on, the other people are making more money. How are we going to hold on to our programmers? And then one day we had the fateful meeting. You know, they called a meeting one day and Ray Kazar walked in and handed out $40,000 checks to several of the people who were there who had games that were just about to go and set up. And they introduced like the real royalty plan. And that was the dawning of a whole new age at Atari. The way, the way to get people right, right. And it, I remember that that very, very clearly. And, you know, in fact, I think you were one of these people you're talking about. Well, I was one of those people I was talking about. In fact, sometimes they talk about me and I don't even know it. <laughs> <laughs> At that point, when, when things started to split up like that, uh, when things started to get pretty good, even artists would remember what you say. So, Holy shit. Yeah. <laughs> you have to do something about that. <laughs> I, uh, I well, the fact that you had artists by then says something else. <laughs> yeah, there's a point. Tom Fry was the guy who went and told the target about it. Uh, about that formation. He was the guy who spoke to George Cash, and it was, uh oh, and that was within 48 hours of the meeting. Yeah, um, I have a, a, a comment and then a question. My comment is. Um, I worked for a uh, unnamed company that, that made a, a handheld device where we made games for it. And a lot of things you're saying are, are just incredible how they echo the whole uh, marketing, trying to control the content, uh, the whole conversation about we need more memory, the, the producers want to do stuff that the device is capable of doing. And all of those things you're talking about, I want, to, want you to rest assured that all those things, all those problems you are facing are still alive and well today. Um, and uh, the question on, on behalf of a friend who's too shy to ask it is, uh, what do you guys think of the video game industry today? And I mean, it's sort of a general question, but but is this where you saw it going when you started it? We uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, was a test of fad, like everybody said that it was. Yeah. Uh, we, we had in our gut that it was not just a fad. I don't think any of us expected it to be like what it is today. Uh, I certainly didn't. I mean, we watched I, I still remember being surprised when the first video game magazine came. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we watched it tank right in front of us, and then Nintendo bringing it back with Mario Brothers. That game is, is why it's still happening. So when we were in the thick of it, things were really rolling. I definitely had a very different picture of my future than what it worked out to be once uh, things really started turning around. It was uh, it was weird because in, in one minute, like for a year or two, it was like the top of the world. It was just the whole world was focused on this whole new medium and everything was exciting. And then, like a year later, it was dead. I mean, it was like dead. It's like, you know, the metropolis that turns into a ghost town. It was, it was shocking. I mean, it was really shocking because, I, you know, as much as a year earlier, we're all thinking, this is great. This is going to go on forever. You know, just don't rain on the parade. You know, this just seemed like the ultimate situation. And I don't think in 83, if you had asked any of us, you know, could this be dead in 84? I certainly wouldn't have thought so. I mean, it just was unbelievable. How, it was amazing how fast it rose, but it was also, like, shocking how fast it crumbled. That was the advent of the whole licensing thing that I think first destroyed it. But, uh, I mean, if we were left to just doing original games and marketing never knew where we were at, I think it would have been a totally different thing. Most people think it was cast to kill us. But say anything about any kind of project you may have worked on. <laughs> 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 or some sort of bad timing. But, uh, but I think the other part of the question, the other part of the question was... <laughs> um, the other part of the question, I think, was what do you think of the industry today? 
Um, you know, personally, I mean, you know, I, I heard that uh, what Sims 2, in its, I guess, various online forums, uh, had about 150 people on the project um, when we did our games, uh, until we had some animators, uh, graphics guys, uh, they were one-person projects, almost entirely. We did everything, design, programming, debugging, first draft of the manual, whatever, you know, did our own animations, our own graphics, um, a lot of times our own sounds, or we'd get one of the other guys to help out a little bit. So, um, you know, it was very different. It, it's, it's a little bit like cell phone games are today, um, at least the, the simpler cell phones. So in that sense, um, it's, it's similar, but that's a whole different business model. Uh, than what we had back then. Um, I don't know, my, my personal feeling, and you know, maybe it's just because I'm older and have other exciting things that I like to do with my life, um, uh, that I don't, I don't get as much fun out of a lot of the games as I used to. You know, and so, you know, there's a lot of games that I just won't play. And, and the other thing is they take, you know, too much, too much time of my time right now, whereas before um, I, I did it as, as a job, and then also I would see other games that were good, and I would want to play those, and it also fed back into my job. So it was it was a real good synergy. Um, but I just don't feel I feel like you know the games are really big productions now, and they, and they sort of have to be in a way. But but it's it's harder for me to find the fun games that, that I would like to play, and and I also have other things I want to do. So it's, it's a very, and, and you got big teams now, which which um, didn't have back then. I want to say, uh, obviously games are going to stay. They're still making movies that, I don't know why. <laughs> they make thousands of movies now, and people can still, still go to the movie theater to see them for some reason, even though they've got DVDs and they can see them at home. But the, the thing about the, the large production things is the thing that scares me because uh, it was a big change to go from one to, to five to, to 20 production teams working for for two years for a movie they can do it in six months. They have more people than they can do it in six months. And the game can take a few years. And so what's it for? If we go by Moore's Law that you have 10 times more processors to interlink with each other and, uh, 200 people production teams, I don't think you can do games that way. Uh, not, uh, not more than 10 a year, that's going to be a really a good business. That's going to make a change. The thing about having a big production team like that is you've got to plan it all ahead of time. So you get everybody doing things in the right order. Whereas we start working on something and work, ah, knock this, you know. <laughs> Throw away this 3K encoder that they've been working on for the last three months and, uh, and basically start over and do it. It was a lot more of a creative process. I don't know if any of you saw earlier this morning by 11, 11.30, Al Alcorn, Steve Risto, Steve Mayer. Um, they were talking about how a lot of their stuff happened kind of haphazard. They were trying to do something. You know, they just mess around with it. Wow, you know, they got something that was working. It's like, cool, you know, but there was other things that they would try and go, no, this doesn't make sense. And back then, risk was accepted. Yeah, it's not right. anymore. It's, yeah, uh, yeah not, not, not often. There's two levels of the question that I think you were you were getting to. And one is like, what's the industry like, you know, from a player's perspective, what are the games coming out now versus then? And what's it like to work it, to make games, you know, back then? And the thing that always strikes me is back then a game was a work of authorship. You know, it was one person doing it. Now a game is a collaborative effort. And that means a lot of stuff. One is that somebody used to own the game. You know, in the beginning, there was ownership in the game. You had pride in the game, it was not ego based programming. You know, I mean like you cared about what your game was. Now there's so many people on a game, I don't think you have that level of buy-in on the people who are making it. Another thing is that if these projects are so big, they're so monolithic, that when you get them moving, like Rick is saying, I mean, you have to plan this thing out to get it going. And in the old days, if something, if your game sucked, you could just change it, or you could redo it, or you could abandon it and go in another direction. You know, because you didn't have that much invested in it. And now people are, I mean, there is risk-averse stuff that goes on now, but that's because the game then was developed for way under $100,000. Now if the game's like $10 million, and 
the game starts moving in that direction, people are afraid to stop it or change it because it's this big thing that's moving. Well, that's the other thing. When you got 20 people production teams and it takes a few million dollars, that's one thing. But if you go up to 200 people production teams, then it's going to cost $30 million, like a really, really big movie. And you can only make a few of those. You only make a few, and you can't redirect them. You know, once you've committed that many man years or woman years or, you know, designer years to a project, you know, the idea of just throwing that out and moving in a direction, people go, oh, we can't afford that. You know, well, can you afford to release a game that sucks? You know, well, but the fact is they go, yeah. <laughs> they, 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 they seem that people are more willing to be. I mean, people are more willing to be. But you also, the other thing you notice is that you don't see the range of titles and concepts that you used to because that it was about innovation then and now it's about limiting risk. So now you have like four different types of games that people do. And every game is the same thing because that's deemed not that risky. And you get people, I was in an interview once and I was talking with this company, I think it's the same place you work for, Nameless Inc. And they basically, you know, I was talking with the guys, well, what do you guys do? What are you trying to do with games? And so he goes, well, here's what we do. He goes, we make, you know, we make sports games. You know, we make sports, essentially, he was saying sports knockoffs. You know, he says, and this is what we do, and that's our job, and this is, this is what we make. He goes, and what we're looking for is we're looking for the big hit. So I said, okay, so I said, don't you usually you have to do something new to make the big hit, do a little something different? He goes, I don't know. We don't like to, we know what we do. We make sports games. So I said, okay, so what you want to do is you want to make the same game you guys have been making for 10 years, and you're looking for the big hit. He goes, right. That's what we're looking for. I said, okay, so I didn't talk to them anymore. <laughs> but it's, that's the kind of mentality you're dealing with. People aren't about making a game. They're about making 15% you know, on their return of investment. That's a whole different thing. How are you going to say? Well, you said it, but you went into it like it. There is any other difficulty, I'll just say this. I mean, I, I'm actually in the industry still, and there's there's some hope. I mean, the company I'm working at right now is pretty good. I mean, they, they, they do some good things. Yeah, these guys back here, I would do it. Anyway, um, you know, they, they, they keep the team small. I mean, I, I, I hope more of this happens. They keep, they keep the team small, they keep the focus on the creative. Uh, it's not so much marketing driven as it is um, kind of an IP thing where they want to come up with an intellectual problem based on you know comics or, or some cool concepts that we just thought of. And, and they're kind of keeping that alive. So there's companies out there that are still doing that. But for the most part, you know, it's, it's this, uh, you know, how safe a bet is this game going to be? And if it's, you know, X amount above their level of you know, safety threshold, it's like it doesn't happen. And you know, it's just, that's, it's kind of sad that that's the way things are going because the only thing I want to say too is that I think that the genres that are out there right now are kind of getting old. I mean, I've been playing first person shooters now for I don't know how long. But not a whole lot, I mean, it's gotten to the point where every game, is, the only variations on them are, you know, weapons, uh, maps, and, you know, characters and stuff, and it's like, hello, I mean, can't we do something else with video games, like, in general, right? I mean, it's all that good. So, but, yeah, that's... You know, I think that's why the whole casual market is really interesting right now, because, you know, I've been, I've been working with that for the last three years, and it feels like I'm back to where I was in the early 80s, which is stuck in the 80s, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but it allows me to at least see the light at the end of the tunnel when I start the project. And in general, I can do the whole thing by myself. I have my wife help on the art and some of the design and stuff. But uh, the teams are very small. And uh, six to eight months, you're done. And uh, it scales very well, too. And uh, you can turn right away when the game's not playing too well and change it. And uh, there's a, there appears to be a big shift in this area. And, notably up in Seattle, where there's like four or five companies making a ton of money doing this right now. They're very quiet about it. Um, but it is, it, I think it is going to be the future, because a lot of the console stuff right now is very niche. I mean, I play a lot of console games, and uh, I really appreciate the amount of work they put into it. It's still come out with stuff that's actually good. I don't even own one bad PS2 game. It's very good, so I can't knock this whole, it is a big process they go through right now, but there's still a lot of good stuff out there. But it doesn't lend itself to creativity because it's all risk. The money is too risky to deal with. With a smaller type game, you can you can have you can do ten games, 
have eight dogs and maybe you'll come out with two that are pretty good and then you can watch the intellectual property and have it cast it over n number platform. I think that's going to be more of the way of the future. For, there's a lot of frustrated creative people in the audience right now. Uh, everybody I've talked to, they've got issues with the way it is. And it's really a sad thing to see. And uh, the last two days I've been kind of disgusted and happy and disgusted by seeing this kind of uh, you know, talk, and it's just, um, it doesn't, it doesn't have to be that way, though. At least your hair is still in the 80s. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's coming away, and let me tell you. <laughs> One thing I'd like to say about creativity and stuff like that, and that is that it's, it's true that we are more relegated to, in the mainstream games, total commitment to just, you know, some model of the design, and there's very little variation. Nonetheless, there are opportunities for it. Like, I still think Grand Theft Auto, you know, theming aside, is an amazing game. And that game did not do anything new technologically, did not do anything new in game mechanics. It was all designed. This game was organized in a fresh way. That was all designed. And I still think that, you know, te technology and art are the things that you can definitely improve in a game. But design is what makes the game. That's what you play with. You play with the design of the game. And the game rules. You know, the technology and the art just facilitates that. But it takes real talent. I think it takes real insight to come up with that. And that's why you don't see that much of it, right? Grand Theft Auto, there's not, it's not technological and it's not artistic innovation. It's game design innovation. It's one of the first times you've seen that in a long time. It's a game that's in standard genres, but it's a new take on that specific stuff. Now, why don't you, now people try to rip off Grand Theft Auto and they can't quite do it, right? Because the people who are ripping it off can only rip off the technology, which is easy to rip off, but the part that's hard to rip off is coming up with that many new game design twists and that many new strategies to exploit in a game. That's, there aren't many people who are good at coming up with gameplay. There just aren't very many. Even in the game industry, there are very, very few. And so the games that are really solid, when you do see innovation, you don't see that ripped off all over the place because there are people aren't that good. <laughs> and people who aren't that good cling to the stuff that they can do, which is art and technology. And that's why you get where we are. You have people who want to invest more money and they don't have more talent to play with. And so they do what they can do instead of what people would really like to see them do. And I mean, I think that's my ultimate answer to the question of like, what's the difference between the industry then and now? Then we experimented. Now there isn't enough to put together to do that work. And most of us, when we're interviewing at a company, we'll be asked these trite C++ questions. They never, <laughs> they never ask us about game design. Would you agree with that, Bob? I mean, they, they just, I mean, they, it's very... They, they ask you about game design, but then eventually they go into that area. Where I've never been asked about game design. It's just, you know... Well, I've been asked, they say, you're not going to get involved in game design, are One main difference I noticed when I was at THQ for a while, and um, and they, they had said that every one of their games is supposed to take 40 hours to complete the entire game. That's so what they're calling it, right? No. <laughs> 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 it's supposed to take you 40 hours to complete a game, whereas uh, uh, in our day, um, you would only play the game for a few minutes, but you had to, you had to keep pressing the reset button and keep playing it for you. It's all about the factor. Yeah. And that was the factor where you uh, subconsciously press, press the uh, reset button and keep playing it on you. You don't even know why. <laughs> I was just wondering, you brought up Super Mario Brothers, and I'm thinking, when you saw Nintendo arrive on the scene, did you think it was going to be until early this decade when another American company successfully marketed a console, or did you, did you realize that the baton had been passed to Japan? I, I was just glad to see that box in that game, because when I looked it up, I was like, whoa, you know, there's still some hope, because it was totally dead. I mean, they had the robot thing, the gun thing, and then uh, I think Mario came out just a little bit later. I'm not sure when. Totally hooked on it. And it was an 85. And uh, I don't know. I, I, I would say that game solely brought it back. Brought the consoles back in, you know. 
question about casual games. You mentioned that you see that there's a very fresh generation. Um, can you expand a little bit about the interesting thing, things that you have seen recently in casual games? Like, where do you see it going? What are the companies? What uh, kind just, of um, It's like most of the games anybody can pick up and play. Uh, and these are the people that have never even touched a console game. And for good reason, because there's really nothing that looks appealing. And uh, <coughs> I just I see a whole new audience gravitating towards the I mean the cell phone and the advent of the cell phone kind of helps. It's very restrictive and a lot of stuff's getting um, licensed down to those. But also the cell phone is now getting heavy ended with the 3 3D stuff, so that's gonna be another problem. But uh, uh, I just see the I see the casual game stuff hopefully migrating over to the consoles, you know. Um, get more of the family members playing the game. It's still very niche now what people are playing. Uh, but it's interesting to present a, a, an easy entry game to somebody who hasn't played a game before. I mean, I don't want, I, this game I'm working on right now, and I watched, I watched my mom and my aunt playing it. They, they're not around computers at all, and it totally took me back to see that. And it actually made me think that it is possible to get people that normally don't even play games on track to trying these games out. I, just think, I think the future is good for the development community because uh, people don't get burned out. There's a lot of burned out people on two-year projects floating around and take, it's taking years for them to heal right? when I talk to people. And, uh, but it doesn't have to be that way. You know? uh, so I'm just hoping a lot of people can get excited about building these things and, and, and paying developers appropriately to do it. And, I don't know if I'm answering that question. What is the one game that you've seen recently in terms of casual games? So what, type, what type of games? Yeah, what are some of the titles that you've seen with your respect? Uh, well, I'm finding it odd that Zoom is doing so well because the interface is such a skill-based type of thing. Um, but it, it is doing well. I think a, a lot of card type games are, are pretty consistent on how they work because the interface is pretty, you know, pretty obvious. Their cards, there's a rule set to it. People are very patient with figuring it out because it's a card game. There's got to be some logic with these 52 cards. Um, stuff that, and it's also something they've seen before. And the complexity doesn't have, it doesn't have to be very complicated to do these. And it's just, you can't make them simple enough, actually. Which is, it's kind of hard for these to make them so complicated if you're making games for these niche markets if you're in the console community. And it's, it's kind of takes a while to step back and, and try to just, you know, make something very basic and easy to enter and play, not confusing. It's quite a while, actually. Over here, you've been back about 10 rows. <laughs> it's very patient. I thought it was uh, interesting that you were, uh, some of you guys were mentioning uh, how oppressive licenses were back in the early 80s, but it seems like uh, nowadays there's even more licensing of IP from outside of the movie, from outside of the games industry, especially when you consider that you know EA, the largest publisher, pretty much everything that they do is licensed either from a sports league or, or from the movies. Um, I'd love to know uh, what you thought about it back then, what you think about it now, and if you have any thoughts on how uh, the IP can flow the other way. It made sense. You know, I did one of the first movie licenses I think there was. You know, Raiders of the Lost Ark, I think, was one of the first movie licenses that we did at the time. And it was, uh, it's Brad Catcher was a good movie. Superman. <laughs> <laughs> no, Superman was the first one, absolutely. Yes. Superman was good. And it was like, you know, when I heard of that, I thought, cool. See, I like the idea of a movie license, okay? I liked it better than a coin-op license. Okay, because with a coin op license, people have a specific expectation of what the game is. You know, with a movie license, I you know, I know why the marketing people wanted to go do that, because there is some appeal. If you can attach that, and I thought, good, so I'll get to do what I like to do, which is try to make an original game, and just be able to attach a nice name on it, as long as I can structure it loosely along the lines of the movie. And I thought it was a positive thing. I thought it was a good thing, but that was different from the idea of trying to meet the movie release. See, the idea of having a license that's going to join in and help your title 
that there's a lot of positive things to that, and that's cool. The idea that that is now going to restrict the development to a specific schedule and a specific content, that's a problem. Because like I think one thing we've all said here, one point or another, is you know the uh, the ability to change your direction and you know to remedy a game that's in trouble. That's what making video games always was, and I think still is about. But what's happened is the ability to react and change a game in development. That's the thing that seems to get pushed up farther and farther and farther under the screen. So when you go to casual games, you go to cell games and stuff like that, it is a revitalization in some ways of games that are small enough in development commitment that still have the freedom and flexibility to go. By the same token, you know, you gotta remember that, you know, games on the PS2 today, they're a much different experience than a VCS game. You know, it's like, you know, there are games that suck now, and there were games that suck then, and there were games that were great then, and there are some games that are great now. But a good game on the PS2 is a much more in in intriguing experience to me than a good game on the VCS ever was. Although I still play some VCS games. But it's like, it's hard to do. It's a harder job, it's a bigger task, and you know, one person can't do a good game on a modern platform. And you can't innovate. There's just, you can't, there's no risk taken uh, with a casual market. You can have 10 developers, you know, and have eight flops, two good ones, you know, um, six to eight month projects, but you can't do that in the console market right now. I think the average lifespan is what? For the developers on a project, two years? Is that uh, what it is? But, yeah. yeah. Has it been out of actually a flat game every year? Was it every well, yeah, it was the first one. It took like 18 months, and then after yeah. that, it was a year game. But it's really an ongoing development yeah. of one game that's just right, spitting right. out versions now and then, right? Um, by the way, well, well, for that, well, yeah. So, yeah. I mean, it, there's no innovation. I mean, it's because we can't be. Because it's too risky. The shareholders, you know, want to be pleased and all this stuff. And then you got people literally coming down your back going, yeah, third quarter, you know, when is a certain game with Army Men coming out, you know? <laughs> like, what does that have to do with the game and being good? And, you know, and the answer is nothing. And the answer is nothing. <laughs> and, but, you know, maybe your job or whatever. But, <laughs> but I think licenses, too, you have, you know, the license, uh, the license owners of the, uh, you know, the properties in that, they, they have some say over, you know, how the game's designed, uh, how you know how it's released to improve it, and so um, there, there's less uh, creativity allowed there because you know they want to see these steps, they want to see the design, they want to see you know all the different steps and see uh, you know different you know how's it coming along and, and, and all this. And um, if you change something, not only do you have to deal with your own management if you're at a company, you know, game design development company, you got to deal with you know the, the license. Or of, of, the, of um, the property, <clears throat> and so I do think that that uh, well, it, you know, it, it does sell, it helps sell games, especially if the game is, is decent. It, it does um, cut back on the creativity, like you were saying. It takes a lot of people to make a video game now, and that salaries you have to pay, and that is real money. And whether it's a private or a public business, the business has to make money to survive. So on some levels. You know, there is the realistic expectation that if you don't put out a product in a reasonable time that draws an audience and generates revenue, it's going to die. You know, the company is going to die. There's no choice. So it's a natural thing. You know, you need the creativity and the freedom to make something that's going to be a, a successful product. On the other hand, you need to put a product out to be able to keep the company surviving unless people are willing to work for free. And you got to get the right team together that that uh, upper management can trust to build the game and let them do their job. And I know that you've heard that all before, but it's pretty much and the game's done when it's done. And uh, <laughs> I think it was <laughs> it's interesting at, at, at Atari was um, they had made money off of their coin op games. So they had a chunk of money. They were still private. This was before Warner took over and the consumer stuff started. So they were able as a you know private company that was generating revenue. Um, to basically take that risk, and they were so passionate and so into this business of video games that I think that's one of the things that really helped Atari um, because they already had, you know, their their franchise in, in arcade games and were making good money at it, and so now they were branching into the home. 
And plus, they had some titles that you know we could uh, you know the miniaturized 26 ver 2600 version of. Um, so you know, sometimes if a company is successful, got money, and is still private, uh, and is willing to take a risk, that that uh, might be the kind of place to look for if you're looking to be in the business. Where is that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, what, where, where, did they stay long enough at the to work on the 5200 games or as many 100 games? And if so, was it, how different was it to program for either platform compared to the DCS? Was it a lot more difficult? Was it a lot easier? Well, let me, let me start with that one if I can. Um, it was a lot more difficult. It was dealing with our, um, our animator. Um, <laughs> No, actually, I gotta say, I mean, it was it was different because now I had to deal deal with an animator. But Alan did it. He worked with me on uh, primarily on Xevious, 5200 Xevious, and he did an excellent job. I mean, it was good to the point where I, I mean, I'd always done my own animations and things like that. There was no way I could have done that. No way. So um, two years of our school. Talk to him. <laughs> and you know, oh, okay, I won't even bring it up. I know I, I will bring it up. No, no, no. I will. I will. No. Zero and one, right? Yeah, zero and one, yeah. Oh, yeah. Programmers count from zero, you know. He, he was kind of new to it. He always counted for one. He always gave me these graphics. They were always really good, but they were always off by one, you know. I couldn't run the game, and I got all this crap, you know. So, um, so uh, I think, you know, finally he learned about counting from zero. But no, it was. So, so <laughs> it also we had more memory, more power on the 5200. Um, it was it was actually, um, except for the controllers, it was actually a very good game system. And the controllers is really what killed it because they had 90 day warranty and they broke an average of uh, 21 days. So do the math. Uh, you can't stay in business pretty long, you know, constantly uh, putting out sending controllers to people who return theirs under warranty. Um, that, that's, that's sort of my take on it. I was originally hired to program on that thing, but it's kind of numbers out there because it wasn't released. Really so I wanted to go with the 2600. That was a great way to get management off the back in three days. My first three days, I had nobody watching what I was doing. So it was really good. But I don't, I don't know anything about the 5200. Anybody else? Yeah, I was going to say the 5200 is actually great for artists, aside from the not um, you know, because like the 2600 had very few colors and the, the pixels were all wrong. I'm, I'm, I don't even see them. And so the challenge was to draw anything that was recognizable with, with this business. 5200 came along and it had a one by one aspect ratio. You could draw stuff fairly well and it had all these different displays. It was basically an Atari 800 with a GTI HA which uh, was, at the time, was, was pretty, pretty good stuff. It was better than Apple's machine. So, uh, and then we had great programmers. <laughs> when I was doing the tools, um, the first animation program I used was written by Dave Toyber, who wrote the program Tempest. And uh, his wife hired me, she, uh, she was the first editor of the And uh, it was just great. It was basically like a traditional uh, animator's uh, cell, uh, I forget what they call them, light table, where you can you know, take onion skins and make it one frame, peel it back, see the next one, put it back over, and you can see how the frames are going together. He did this in software in 1980 or something. I'm like, yes. I mean, it was very few pixels, but uh, to me, going from the 2600 to the 5200 was like night and day. Yeah, the like, yes. they were able to achieve well, photorealism. <laughs> <laughs> You can actually have two different colors on a player in the same scan line, <laughs> which you couldn't do on the 2600. <laughs> what all attention did you guys pay to your competitors, both on the VCS and on the other two machines? We were asked to take code from other people's parts. I mean, I think so. I was asked point blank and said, no, I'm not doing that. They could have We went to dinner with them. <laughs> I had a manager tell me to take a kernel, rip it off, and take it. Whoa, really? Yeah. That's too bad. No, I'm not going to say. <laughs> well, looking at the actors. <laughs> 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 
We're looking at the Activision games. Uh, we had to come up with uh, no flicker and around ball. And from that point on. Like programming originally in games was really like a brotherhood. I mean, I think there really was a deep connection among the people who were doing it. So when these other companies formed out of well, Activision ad, but in Magic, was still part of people we were very close with, I think. And uh, we would get together with them. I mean, there were times we did stuff, like I remember there were a couple times we had these things where a bunch of the Atari programmers, a bunch of the Magic programmers all got together at one of our houses and we all showed our games that were in development. Okay? And we all showed what we did. And we're just you know, sharing and going on like this. Now, if the lawyers, the, you know, execs, and either company would have heard about this, they would have gone ape shit because this would have been all kinds of like industrial espionage, blah, blah, blah. But the fact is we weren't going to rip each other off. We just wanted to see what each other does. And we still had a connection to each other that the companies weren't able to maintain. So there was always this duality. There was, I think there was always a strong sense of brotherhood, I think, between us, the people who had worked together and did it. And the company boundaries didn't mean anything for that. But for a lot of the other people in the companies, the company boundaries were very important and all about that. And like you said, you know, it's like we would go and show our games to each other, but Steve wouldn't rip off a kernel if he was ordered to, you know, from someone else's game. And that's and that was kind of and it was a tough place to be in some ways. That know? was the spirit of the times too, because the same thing happened in computer games, home computer games, you know, see it online, you know, show it to other people. I mean maybe I'll pay them for it. Yeah. <laughs> How was it determined in the early days, who got which project versus after you're getting royalties, who got which project? That list. A we still, no, there was the list of games they wanted, and as you came up for a game, you pretty much got your choice of what the upcoming titles that they wanted to do were. It wasn't it wasn't like a horrible grab, but I don't recall there being much conflict over who got hey, I was I offered everyone to do E T. I mean I stood up at the meeting and said, anybody else who wants to do this game in five weeks, just say so. I would totally give it to you. No, I couldn't give that thing away. The rest of us the rest of us were just a little smarter than Howard. <laughs> and that's still the case. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah, just um, a very strange thing. You were doing all these other consumer games, and somehow you always seem to sneak in here and there, not just in Atari, but other companies as well, um, some uh, good uh, games for school, good edu uh, 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 educational games. There weren't a lot of them. Uh, so Those were the fun ones, ones, right? I'm sorry? Those were the fun ones? The um, no, no. There were other other companies that went into it a lot more. TI, for instance, went into educational games a lot more. So you but mean I, the covert? I, I, I always, I, uh, you mean the covert educational games or the covert educational? Games? Both, <laughs> both, because there there are things in some games. Uh, which you guys probably just threw me in to say, well, you know, if this this whole game started out as an upright video arcade game. We had to make the, the home version. Well, we had to slow it down so the little kids could play. And apparently, you guys probably took some home and let your own kids play with it. So now we got to slow it down some more, or or things to that effect. And those things in those games can still be used today in classrooms. As crazy as it sounds. Example? Yeah. Uh, setting up a Atari uh, 2600 with a bunch of educational games in a preschool classroom, what, which, which you can do today. If you were putting an Xbox into a preschool classroom, you would be hard put finding educational games to play on. So which but the kids would still rather use the Xbox. <laughs> <laughs> You'd be very hard to find so a perfect educational example? games. And what's I'm just asking, you know, there were a whole bunch of things that you guys put in there in some of the educational games, some of the fun games that were educational. And are you seeing that in the game industry today? Because what I've seen is that it's very hard to find anything appropriate educational below a certain age group. Well, that's why that's why Leapfrog exists, um, I guess. But um, I'm, I'm still, you know, Rick was asking. I'm still, I'm still not sure which educational games you're talking about. Are games that you you consider are good for preschool that run that run the 2600. 
Um, are there any specific ones? That, like that, Math Grand Prix or? Yeah, what is it, yeah uh, any, any of the math games, any of the games where you had to spell with? There were some Sesame Street ones. Oh, yeah. Okay. Those four are very good. Okay. <laughs> there's, there's, a, there's a one. Yeah, we were so, we were so involved in those. But I mean, if you look at like Warren Robinette's adventure game, I mean, there was, yeah, there's you know problem solving and, and, and things of that nature. And there were other games that had educational uh, things sort of snuck in, but you know, generally to look at something like Math Grand Prix, and my my opinion of that one was like, why would you play this game? Because there's a much better racing game out there, and you don't have to do the math. Right. <laughs> Our official time is up, but you're welcome. To Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What you're talking about, so like the list of games and so like we did Watson, so just directing towards Rick there regarding Space Invaders, because let's that, face it, it was probably the first killer app game for the Crazy Panther that came up. I was wondering, did he pick to do Space Invaders? Did Matthew pick him to do it? Have you any idea how it, it was going to absolutely explode in terms of sales? In the early days, we didn't have any management. <laughs> <laughs> And it, which, which has a, you know, a good point from what you heard here, but it has a bad point that if you wanted to do anything, you couldn't do it because you didn't know how to do anything. But there was a guy in charge of this. But anyways, I came in and uh, I looked at uh, the, uh, the, the specs for all the BCS works for, for a few days and uh, looked at some code. That, those first four guys have done, and uh, also looked at Lauren's book for a few days. And then he said, I need to do a game. So I went around and looked at you know, all, of, all the games, and, and we could just, there wasn't a license deal at that time. So I said, Space Invaders, that's a great game. I really enjoyed playing it. And I started doing it. And I couldn't get anybody but these guys <laughs> to play the game. <laughs> they didn't like it or and so I thought it was a bad game, and I started working on something else. Um, so I started working on what became Maze Crazy for, for a few months. Um, and then all of a sudden, all of a sudden, uh, they've got these Time and Newsweek articles about how many quarters are going into the space emitter machine from Japan and in the U.S. And uh, the management was decided that we needed to have a space emitter. See, that's when the license made sense. He wanted to do it, work on it, focusing on it, as opposed to being, you know, throwing a license and having to do it. I'm not saying <laughs> Yeah, but there was, you yeah, know, you wanted to do it. Even then, it was kind of like, oh, you know, now they decided on they wanted to be hurt. It was already in progress, and so I, I got it going, and they made a big technological leap there with the that's like the whole Atari experience in a microcosm yeah. right there. It's like a programmer is working on a game that the marketing isn't aware that this development is going on, and suddenly someone through some other channel might go, wait a minute, oh, this is a great idea. We've got to go do this. And then they'll come to, oh my god, we've got to do space, we've got to do space and they go, well, we're already doing it. Go, well, hurry up! Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of what the whole scene was. Can you put a round ball on it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Got any more? I guess we're officially, we're officially done, done, but we'll, you know. Uh, oh. Anyone have any girl accents? Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, go ahead. Okay. Uh, does anyone have any comments on sort of uh, meta games? Like uh, pinball construction set was fantastic. Um, is there uh, yeah, is there room for that today? Days worth of, uh, sweet yeah. Game maker. Yeah, game maker. Yeah, Gary Kitchen's game maker. Game maker. How many hours did you lose? Uh, my entire 16th year of my life. <laughs> <laughs> 
I think, uh, yeah, just to go back to the educational thing, like for an example that you were looking for, uh, when I was in high school, I was a wrestler, and I ended up getting three concussions in a matter of like 18 months, and it really dulled the senses and all that, and one of the ways I helped rehabilitate myself was, of all things, brain math. We're just sitting there and just constantly pounding on that until it was doing faster. Why'd you go back to wrestling after the first attempt? <laughs> <laughs> Basically the first one's when I stopped and then I got two more randomly within that soon. <laughs> Yeah, yeah um, I have a question about um, uh, life after Atari. How was life after Atari when you went to Tengen and wrote Super Sprint, and then you wrote the unreleased uh, Police Academy? Whatever happened to that game? Uh, see, Mark Trammell somehow was working at Hasbro, and long story short, Tengen ended up with this license, Police Academy. It was very hard at the time to do any kind of original material. Um, at Tanya. Um I originally interviewed there at uh, Atari to do a coin off game. And he said, well, you got all this uh, other Atari consumer experience, so why don't you do a few Tanya titles in the consumer market, and then we'll let you go over to coin off. And I was like, oh, okay, whatever. And um, so Super, uh, Police Academy was on the list, and uh, I was like, okay, we'll just do a sideways scroller with it. And, uh, I got like three months into it, and we focus grouped it, and I think the focus group it was Cyberball on um, 8-bit Nintendo, and it tested great, and um, I, I couldn't believe it, actually, there were people saying they played it for hundreds of hours, just the first couple of levels. I get back to start working on it, and they canceled it on me, and they gave it to a whole other group to work on, and, uh, and that bombed the focus group, the second version of it. So at that point, I, I think I went to Sega at that point. Uh, Super Sprint, I, I worked on the track layouts of the Nintendo version. Um, Bill Hindorf picked up a lot of the programming stuff from another programmer that had left. And, uh, that, I mean, that was a fun project. It was totally tedious, though. You know, each cell was laid out with uh, a dimensional array of data of what the card was supposed to be each time it would cross the uh, cell. Life after Atari. What was life after Atari when you went to Tango? Um, Tango was part of Atari. Yeah, they, they wanted, it was their answer to um, to consumer, you know, doing eight, uh, the 8-bit um, eight stuff on the SNES. And uh, I don't know if I can say this story. Uh, anyway, when I first got hired there, we had this meeting, and uh, they were talking about chip allocation and whatnot. I was like, why don't you just order more chips from, you know, Nintendo to solve this complex knowledge for the chips in the room, but dead silent. And, I'm like, no. and uh, <laughs> uh, that's when I found out that they were trying to do their own internal.